Because with our cases, I mean, most of the American families did not believe in reincarnation before their child started talking about a past life. And of course, our culture doesn't believe that. Um, so mm -hmm. from a scientific standpoint, it, it's a cleaner phenomenon here than it would be in other places. Dr. Tucker, thank you so much for coming on to At the End of the Tunnel. It is an honor and a pleasure to talk to you. I've been personally fascinated by the topic that we're going to discuss today, which is reincarnation, for a very, very long time. And, uh, and it's, it's awesome to have someone who's considered a, a probably, would you say you're the world's foremost expert in uh, reincarnation at this point? Well, I wouldn't go that far, but, but I'm one of a small number of people who study cases of purported past life memories. Awesome. And you all know each other, obviously, right? Yeah. 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 And, and unfortunately, it's an aging field. There are not a whole lot of us left uh, who do this kind of investigating cases to see if they can be verified. Uh, but there's right. still, uh, still a few of us left. So what was the first case that sort of blew you away once you got behind the scenes in that work? Well, the first case I saw was one that's, that's in my books of a uh, little boy who was born with three more or less birthmarks that, that matched ones on his deceased half-brother. And, and you know, then he talked about the half-brother's life. And it was... Yeah, it's rich in a number of ways, but it's it's also, um, I mean, you see what the families go through with with a situation like this. So talking with his mother also meant talking, of course, with his half brother's mother who had lost a child. Um, so you know, you see, it's not just sort of analytical uh, and intellectual exercise, but it, it's really looking at, at at the most meaningful slash tragic thing that that a parent could ever go through. Can you just talk about that a little more as, as a sort of case study of, of the type of, of approach you all take to um, these cases in terms of the 200 variables or metrics and how you sort of verify a claim? Yeah. In, in that case in particular, you mean? Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this was one that um, the previous little boy, toddler, really, had had uh, cancer and um, eventually he started limping, then eventually fell and had a, a broken leg and got diagnosed with, with cancer and started getting uh, chemo treatments. Um, he was, by the end, he was essentially blind in one eye due to a tumor. Uh, he had had a, a place on his scalp that had been biopsied where the, the diagnosis was made. He had, had chemo running through a, a central line, a large IV in his neck. Um, and after he died, I mean, the, his mom went through kind of life and, and had a couple of kids. And then 12 years later had this little boy where um, he was essentially blind in, in the same eye. It was a different cause, fortunately, it wasn't a tumor, but, it, but he had the same experience of being blind in the eye. Uh, he had this nodule. Uh, on a scalp where the, the previous child had, had the tumor biopsy. Um, he had this, this odd scar on, on his neck uh, birthmark that looked like a scar, looked like a little cut where the uh, boy had the, the chemo going in. And then when he got old enough to walk, he actually limped, uh, sort of matching the, the gait of, of his um, half brother, even though as far as anyone knew, he had no reason to do so. So with that case, you know, we want to verify all that. So we got the previous boy's medical records, which were you know, hundreds of pages. And we went through them all and we were able to document not just the, the lesions that his mom had described, but also like making sure they were on the right side. You know, it's on the right side of the neck and the right side of the scalp and all that. Um, so as yeah, an example, as much as possible, we don't take anyone's word for anything we don't have to. So. You know, in a case like this with birthmarks or birth defects, then we're getting autopsy reports if we can, or in this case, getting medical records uh, to confirm it. Um, in addition, you know, the, the boy talked about uh, places and, and events that happened in, in the um, half-brother's life, um, including one he, he told us that he had never told mom before about a, a um, if I recall correctly, visiting a... Um, 
a camp of some sort um, with a cousin and, and all that the mom verified. Um, so we take all the information we can and um, we have a long list of things that we go through, some related to the memories and some more general. Uh, and, and then we take all that information and code it uh, and put it into a computer database. Uh, like you said, it's 200 variables that we code for. Uh, there may be no case where all we have information on all 200 variables, but uh, we, we put in as much information as we can. And, and um, that way we can analyze the, the phenomenon on, on sort of a um, full group level as opposed to just the individual cases. And the kids are normally um, anywhere between, as soon as they can start talking, really, up to like around, what, five or six years old or something like this? Yeah, typically they'll start around the, their third birthday. The, the average age when they start talking about a past life is 30, I think it's 35 months. Um, so two or three when they start coming out with it. Sometimes, of course, the parents have trouble understanding what they're talking about initially, or they'll even be making signs like um, hand signs, like uh, um, finger to the head, you know, and then talk about how they've been shot. Um, so it starts very early. Now, occasionally there are exceptions, like if kids are slow talking, you know, if they've had ear infections or whatever, uh, then it may come out later. Or there are ones where when it comes out later, it's often that something in the environment triggers the memories and they say, oh, I did that in my last life. Um, and then, yeah, it's a narrow window. I mean, usually by the time they're school age, they have stopped talking about these things um, and then they just go on with their lives. Um, now, whether they totally forget or not, is another question. And, and lately we have gone back and talked with adults who we originally studied as kids. And a fair number of them say they do still have some memories even though they stopped talking about them. Um, you know, they've gotten pretty vague at this point, but, but some of them will persist. What's an example of a case that where a memory was triggered and then once it was triggered, it became like a whole whole thing for the kid that they that he you know played out on a regular basis and i'm thinking of james three but maybe there's another one or that yeah. one either one uh well yeah i mean that one actually started at a very early age started with nightmares so i i mean he had visited an air museum but but it wasn't immediate that he where that happened but uh, mm -hmm. there's one case for instance in sri lanka where the family was taking um, a bus trip and at one of the stops, the boy started saying that he had lived there before and then gave various details. Um, and then later people went back and you know, tried to investigate and found in fact the details matched a, a child who had died there. Um, so it, it does happen, but, but it's more typical where it's just spontaneously, the children start saying, you know, I used to do this or, or um, I had different parents and, you know, my last mom did such and such. Right. And I think that it, it, it leads into this idea of the sort of separate ways that our society, our Western society treats the idea of reincarnation versus uh, maybe Asian societies or just more ancient societies. And so after a couple of years of volunteering, you, you were, you were invited to go to Asia to study some of these cases. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about what you saw in terms of those differences and the way that they get handled by the families and by the society itself? Yeah. So that was in the late nineties that I went and it was before, was before we had an internet site, a website and, you know, before the internet had fully got going. So anyway, my point is at the time we didn't realize there were so many American cases uh, so you know, the reason that Ian Stevenson had gone all over the world studying cases was he went wherever he could find them. And, and he had people looking for them in various places. So in Asia, a surprising number of parents who are Buddhist or Hindu, I mean, believe in reincarnation, but a surprising number actually do not like their children talking about a past life. Uh, there's a belief in some places that talking about a past life will cause you either to get sick or to have a short life this time around. Uh, and there are also times where what the child says after a while gets irritating to the parents. You know, my, my last 
parents were much better or you know, I had a much bigger house before. Um, <laughs> so like in India, about 35% of the parents will try to suppress what the children say. But even so, I think the difference is that they believe the children, they just don't want them talking about past life, but they, they believe it. And, and that is very different from many American families where the parents don't believe it and may not even recognize it. You know, that they think that the parent, I mean, the child is just fantasizing uh, or just talking nonsense and they kind of blow it off. Um, now there are plenty of American parents who don't do that. And of course, those are the ones we're likely to hear from. But um, it is a different uh, way of responding uh, to such statements. Also in Asia, well, to some extent here too, but in Asia, if a family has lost a family member and then they, a child starts saying that they used to be you know, grandpa, um, many of the families are relieved by that. And, and uh, they, they may want the child to be the reincarnation of, of that person and, and they may encourage the child to talk more. So it, you know, it can go either way. And, and um, with those cases, especially the same family cases, we do have the concern that there has been such a, a wish uh, by the family to have the person return that it, it has really colored the case. And, and um, you, know, you may have either led the child to say more or maybe the, the family misinterpreted what the child has said. Do you remember uh, the case of Chloe in Thailand, speaking of, of, of which, and, uh, and that kind of, I wanted to also circle back around to the birthmark um, aspects of these cases, but can you, can you recount that story for us? So we can kind of bridge those two things together. Yeah. So that, that's a case that a colleague and I, Jurgen Kyle um, studied a long time ago now, but it was a little boy where his grandmother um, before she died, it said how she wanted to come back as a male. And mm -hmm. um, after she died, her daughter-in-law took some white paste and made a mark down the back of her neck. Um, and then a year later, this grandchild was born, um, this little boy. And he was born with a birthmark that really looked quite like somebody had just made a mark down the back of his neck. This, this, this pale, uh, what looked like a finger going down the neck. Um, and then when he got old enough to talk, he didn't talk a lot about her life, but, but did say that he had been her and identified uh, like you know, different things that had been hers. Um, and he also um, showed a lot of gender nonconformity um, where he would, um, 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 well, he'd want to wear her dresses or her makeup or jewelry a lot. Uh, he, he would not do sort of the typical rough and tumble boy play there, but, but would be playing with the girls more and, and, and various other things, um, which at the time we actually published the case as, as what was then known as gender identity disorder. And of course, things have really evolved since then. Uh, but, you know, with gender nonconformity um, in the general population, most young children show sort of gender typical behaviors and or stereotypical behaviors really. And, and, you know, we can talk a lot about what may lead to that, but, but most kids will show gender typical behaviors like little boys playing with trucks or little girls playing with dolls. And again, there are all kinds of environmental influences, but anyway, that's what we see. Uh, but about 3% of boys and 5% of girls will show gender nonconformity. Well, in our cases where the child remembers a life as a member of the opposite sex, it's 80% of those kids show gender nonconformity. Uh, so the you know, suggestion would be that there's that the past life has had an impact on, on how their, their gender uh, is developing in, in this life. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Chloe, where I guess she was he was born into the same family of this person who passed, there could also have been, this is what a skeptic may think. There could also have been an expectation. Uh, so maybe they were like, you know, cherry picking different ideas or evidence to show that this is who this person actually was, but you guys have a, a control for that, <laughs> which is you, it, maybe not in this case, but in other cases, you show the children a couple of photographs from different 
aspects of their memory to see what they um, what they remember and what they don't remember. So maybe can you talk about an example of, of that where, where you've controlled for, yeah. for that memory? Yeah, so I mean, to finish up the thought on Chloe, I mean, you're right, of course, that that, that I mean, occurs to us, you know, is, mm-hmm. is it that the, uh, the child's um, family's expectations kind of created some of this gen- gender nonconformity? And um, at least at the time that we published a paper on gender identity disorder, there, there was no reason to uh, suspect that families expectations could cause that. Uh, so it gets complicated. And, and uh, you know, the same family cases have inherent weaknesses that other cases do not, because either that the child could learn things about the previous family member, overhearing things, even though the parents don't know that they did, um, or that the parental expectations then do shape the child's behavior or the, uh, the statements. Um, but most of our cases don't involve same families. Um, and as far as the photographs that you talk about, so we've been able to do more of that lately, um, doing photograph tests because we're learning about cases earlier uh, than we often used to. So with the American cases, uh, Ian would hear about cases, but it would often be, say, 20 years later where the, the parents learned about his work and they wrote him to say, you know, when my uh, adult child was, was growing up, he, he did this or said that. Um, but now, of course, if a child is talking about a past life, the parents do a Google search and, and uh, find out about us and can write us. So when we catch kids that are still young and still have these memories, what we try to do is show them controlled picture tests where, uh, for instance, one recent one is a little boy who remembered a life in, uh, or a death in the Vietnam War remember being an American soldier in the Vietnam War. And he told his mother, he gave a last name in, in the state where he said he was from. So she went on the Vietnam Memorial website and was shocked to see that there was a guy with that name. And it's, it's an unusual name uh, that uh, was killed in Vietnam. And, and the boy had said he was 21, which is how old this man was. Um, so she then wrote to us. She didn't try to do any further um, investigation of, of this previous man, but I did and found a variety, uh, eventually a variety of pictures. Um, so I would show him, for instance, the high school where the man went to uh, versus a control high school uh, from a, a, another place and would ask him if, if he remembered either one of them. And, and also some people from the life um, pictures from a yearbook, so a variety of things. And, and anyway, I showed him eight pairs of pictures. There were a couple of them that he didn't make a choice on, but for the others, he was six out of six. Uh, so, and you know, the, his, there's no chance that his mom let on those. She didn't know which picture was the, the right one either. So that there was no parental influence in this case. Uh, and yet he, he showed this ability, which, you know, if you think, well, it's just luck. Well, you know, it's like flipping a coin having to come up head six times in a row, it, it happens, but it, you know, the chances of it happening are, are quite small. I, I watched your Netflix. There's a, a documentary series on Netflix called Surviving Death, and you're in a couple of the episodes. And so it was one thing to read about these cases and how the children behave, but there's another thing to actually see it and to see the nonchalance with which they're like looking at the photos and just like casually, you know, choosing as if there's, there's no question in the world that this is what, what it is. It's like, if any, if anyone was showing anyone listening to this, a picture of their childhood home, you would know it instantly, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you moved around a lot, but if you were in the same place for a significant period of time, you would know it instantly. You would know the pictures of your parents and things like that. Do you find, out of the people that reach out to you, what percentage of these cases would you say, by the time it gets to you, Dr. Tucker, what percentage would you say are legitimate cases versus cases where maybe, I don't know why someone, what motivation would someone would have to, to not be legitimate, but. Well, I think they're probably all or almost all legitimate in the sense that the families are being honest about it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but what we often get, uh, the vast majority of the time, actually, with the emails, is the child has talked about a past life, but he or she has not given the kinds of details that allow the memories to be verified. You know, mm-hmm. If you don't name a person or a place, it's very hard to find out if somebody from the past actually matches the child's statements. Um, so, you know, the, the child may talk with great emotion about a past life and, and may give a lot of details and, and sometimes grisly details. I mean, being raped and murdered and all kinds of things, which, you know, you wonder why a three-year-old would be doing that. But again, without names or places, unless it's a really unique kind of, of death, um, we're not able to verify it. Uh, so we, we were just looking at this. In the last year, we've heard from 150 American families um, about their child talking about a past life. Um, but, but very few of them have we even tried to investigate because there's not enough. Th- I mean, we'll do some on- online searching, but there's often not enough there to uh, be able to con- confirm it. Um, but there are enough cases where we do verify it that I think it, it lends legitimacy to any of the cases, whether they're uh, verified or not. So, you know, if, if your child is having these terrible memories about a, a violent death um, and you're trying to comfort them, it, it may be helpful to know that plenty of these cases, when the child has done that, there actually was somebody who lived and died who's, who matches the memories that the child has. So, you know, the, the the um, parent can know that this is something that they can take seriously and not necessarily build it up for the child, but I mean, that they can be respectful of what the child is saying because we have so many cases where it turns out to be true. You also make a distinction in your book when you talk about your own intent as a, as a scientist and a researcher between proof and evidence. Can you, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, proof is a very high bar that in medicine, uh, we almost never reach. So, you know, when, when new medications get approved, it means that there have been studies that show there's a very good chance that they work better than placebo. And of course, we can identify just what that chance is. So, you know, the, the kind of bar is 95% um, chance that it, that it works. Uh, for, but that's not proof. I mean, that's evidence that it works, but it's not proof that it does. And the same applies to work like this. I mean, we can't give a percentage, but you know, we're, we're I mean, the only proof of, of, I don't know what proof of past life uh, memories or that consciousness has continued from one life to another. Um, I don't know what proof would even look like, uh, but I do know what evidence looks like. So when a child comes up with very specific details, they can only match one person who died in the past and they're complete strangers to the family. Well, you know, that's strong evidence. Um, Ian Stevenson used to say, and other people do too, uh, that proof is a term that should only be used in mathematics. Uh, mm-hmm. but in the world of science, again, it's, it's about the level of evidence uh, not this sort of unobtainable absolute proof. Would you mind um, recounting the story of uh, Ryan and his memory of, of Marty uh, yeah. in, in relation to this evidence and then just the striking detail of yeah. the evidence, particularly as a younger person versus as an older teenager? Yeah, and, and that's one that, you know, as you know, it's on the Surviving Death series. But that was one where, I mean, these days we mostly get emails, but that was when we actually got a letter through the U.S. mail uh, from this mom in Oklahoma who um, said that, that she and her husband are just ordinary folks. She worked in the county clerk's office. Her, her husband's a police officer. But their little five-year-old boy, Ryan, for the last year, had talked about a past life in Hollywood. And he would cry and beg his mother to, to take him home to Hollywood. And this was quite hard for her to endure. You know, it's hard to, as a parent to see your child suffering. And, and he was suffering on a daily basis. So 
um, she had heard that, that if, if kids can kind of process some of this, that uh, see more of the past life stuff, that it, it can help them uh, deal with it. So she went to the public library and checked out some books on Hollywood. And they were looking through one of them one day when uh, Ryan pointed to a picture. There's this picture from an old movie called Night After Night. Uh, it's actually the first movie that Mae West was in. But um, the picture just shows a group of men uh, and a couple of them sort of in the middle, uh, everyone's focused on. And he pointed to one of those and said, hey, mama, that's George. We did a picture together. And then he pointed to one of the men on, on the end and said, mama, that's me. I found me. Well, the first one he pointed to is George Raft, to a young George Raft, who, who you know, went on, well, you may not know, but for those of us of a certain age, but went on to, to be quite well known in, in his day. But the other one he pointed to that he said he had been uh, was an extra with no lines in the movie. So Ryan's mom wrote to me to see if I could help uh, determine who this fellow was. Um, so I went out and, and met, went to Oklahoma and, and met Ryan and his parents. And um, then afterwards, and, and well, let me just say, I think it was helpful for the family, certainly for Ryan's mother that if nothing else, I, I was respectful of what they were going through that, you know, I had traveled halfway across the country to, to take seriously uh, what they were experiencing. Um, so afterwards, as we were trying to figure out who this fellow was, Ryan's mom was writing me, emailing me sometimes on a daily basis with all of these statements that Ryan was making about a past life, which of course we could then log. And eventually with the help of a Hollywood archivist and, and a TV film crew is sort of a long story, but with the help of an archivist, we were able to find out who this was. The, the archivist, she went to the library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and I don't know really that there was such a library, but got all the materials on this movie night after night, most of which was about uh, the stars of the movie. Uh, but then there's one picture of this guy and on the back of it, it identified him as, as this man, Marty Martin. Hmm. Um, you know, which meant that we could then compare what Ryan said to Marty's life. And, and it turned out that even though I really thought it was unlikely this, this extra had had this dramatic life that Ryan was describing, Marty Martin did. So Ryan talked about dancing on stage in New York and, and Marty had danced on Broadway. And he, then he said he went to, to Hollywood to work in the movies, which Marty Martin did mostly working on, on dance in the movies. Um, said that he um, had then worked for uh, an agency where uh, people changed their names and, and Marty Martin started a successful talent agency. Uh, said he had this big house with a swimming pool and, and that the street name had either the word rock or mount in it. And, um, uh, Marty Martin lived on North Roxbury, um, talked about sailing on ships and, and uh, seeing Paris, which Marty Martin did with his, with his wife. Uh, and Ryan also said that one day he said he didn't know why God would let you get to be 61 and then make you come back again as a baby. And Marty Martin's death certificate, he died in 1964. His death certificate said that he was only 59, but his daughter and, and his stepson busted. In fact, it was 61. So I looked into it and found um, a passenger list, three census records and two marriage listings that all gave ages that meant in fact, Marty Martin was 61 when he died. So Ryan was right about that, um, even though the death certificate said 59. Um, so altogether, we were able to verify that over 50 of Ryan's statements matched with Marty Martin's life um, a few were off, and then many more were unverifiable. I mean, there were little details about daily life, which, you know, that long ago we weren't able to verify, but 55 of them we were. And at the time, there was nothing on Marty Martin on the internet. Um, eventually, now people have actually filled in some of the information after this case got some, some publicity, but there's no way that, that Ryan and, and his family uh, found out anything about Marty Martin uh, through some sort of surreptitious means. Yeah, it's uh, it's 
fascinating just the level of detail and and there's another one that I from the book that I wanted you to go into but as you were talking I was just kind of curious around you know when you think about scientific research and 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 who's funding this stuff a lot of times you know you have pharmaceutical companies and you know people who want to kind of make money on the back end in some form or fashion and i'm just wondering what is the funding like for this kind of work i mean are you got can you just hop on a plane at any time and go and do some investigation or is it does it have to be something that gets planned out you have to fundraise to go and and meet up with someone in sri lanka or wherever uh, well, not exactly. I mean, we don't do uh, bake sales for, for trips, but the, uh, you know, we, we've fortunately had uh, a number of donors over the years who have been generous, who believed in this work and, and supported it, um, starting with Ian Stevenson. And, and the only way he was able to form this research division was a man named Chester Carlson, who had been at the Xerox process, um, um, gave a, a lot of money to the university. And, and we've continued with that where, I mean, again, it's, it's um, I mean, we occasionally get grants for this work, but it's mostly donors who are intrigued by uh, this work and you know, respectful of it and, and they uh, help fund our work. How much of your time gets spent sort of verifying or processing a, a single case that seems very promising? Uh, well, it, it varies. And of course, now we can do a lot of that work at our desk, you know, on the internet, but, you know, like with that Vietnam case where um, eventually I was able to learn quite a bit about this you know, man who had died in the 1960s. Um, but I mean, it's usually just one trip to the family, but then again, we can connect about various details that come up, you know, just by email now. Um, but it's, uh, you know, um, sometimes the interviews actually, depending on the kind of case, don't even take more than a couple of hours, but uh, but then kind of the work starts and, and you know, trying to sort out all the details and, and how much of them can be verified. So if, if let's say Marty, Marty Martin's case, you know, he comes out, Ryan comes out in his kindergarten years as potentially the reincarnated father to this daughter or, um, you know, his the uncle to his niece, they're still around. And Ryan's now a teenager and really doesn't remember much. And, and you even wrote that usually after the age of six or seven, they completely forget and they go on to live normal lives. But does that place any kind of pressure I'm wondering on, on these, either the kids or the family just kind of thinking? Because, I mean, if you hear that level of detail about your family, that's all mostly accurate. I mean, you had like 50 something markers for Ryan's case that yeah. kind of matched up it's hard to deny something like that. And I don't know if I'm, what, what I'm, I'm, if I'm asking if it gives closure to the family or if it, it puts pressure on, on, on the kid. I'm just wondering what, what have you seen in relation on both sides as, as these, as the years pass, do people just kind of move on or how does it, what, what happens? Well, it can really vary. And I mean, there are some times where the previous family doesn't believe it, um, but often they do. And, and they're, uh, especially when the child is really young, uh, you know, they, they will want to have a relationship with the, the child's family. Um, and sometimes they do. So they'll be, you know, they'll, I'm thinking more in Asia than here, but they'll have various trips back and forth. Um, sometimes even after the child has moved on and doesn't particularly care to see the previous family anymore, but, but they're still wanting that connection because you know, they build a connection to their, their loved one uh, who died. Um, I think you know, like in, in Ryan's case where the, um, you know, for the TV series, uh, as, as a 16 year old, or I guess he was 15 when they filmed it, but as a 15 year old, um, meeting with Marty Martin's daughter um, and like I said, his niece, I mean, it's, it's too late. So, you know, it can be, I think, kind of frustrating for the previous family in that case that they really want to feel this connection and I mean, connection to their lost loved one. Uh, but the kid's not in that place anymore. Um, so, 
you know, it can be unsatisfying to them. Um, but then, another yeah, example, it, yeah, another example of that connection and going back and forth is from the book, you talked about Kendra and Ginger. Can you re- recount that story? Because I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, that was one where it's unusual in our, um, in our cases that uh, the girl, well, when she met th- this um, um, coach, she felt an immediate um, a- attachment to it and w- was much more friendly and loving with her than, than she was typically with strangers. Um, and started to say that she had been um, in Ginger's tummy and, and had they'd gone through an abortion. Uh, and eventually it turned out that the coach did uh, confirm to um, her mom that in fact she had had an abortion. But, but the attachment became incredibly intense both for the coach and for the child. Uh, where the child has then spent a couple of nights a week at, at the coach's house. And, you know, I mean, I understand certainly that the wish to maintain that connection is not necessarily what the child needs in their development in this life. And, and eventually the, the, the girl's family had a falling out with, with the coach in separate contact, which I think was probably best for the child. Um, so... Yeah, sort of like with I say to, to parents in general, I mean, certainly be open to what the child is saying, be respectful, um, but you don't want to get overly focused on the past life because you don't want, don't want it to interfere with the experience of this life. And um, sometimes, you know, people can't, I mean, it is really interesting and, and, um, and meaningful, but sometimes I think people get a little to focus on it and, and need to let the child just be a child and, and enjoy their life. Is there anything, if, if you're a parent listening to this and you suspect that your child may be displaying some sort of past life memory, is there anything that they should do or shouldn't do to create a safe space for that? Or is there any, is there like, are there like a, a few questions that they should ask to verify whether or not this is actually what this is. Yeah, and we've got a short uh, column of advice for parents on our website, but yeah, as far as what they should do, well, one thing we encourage is people to write down the child statements, you know, so that's setting a written record for us in, in case it can be verified. Uh, but most of the children recall uh, a death by some sort of unnatural means, murder, suicide, combat, accident, that sort of thing. And, you know, those memories can be troubling to the child. So if the parent can be respectful of that and say, you know, I understand that you remember that, but now you're safe here with us and, and really try to emphasize that, that the past is the past and that, you know, things are going to be different this time around, that can be helpful. I mean, and particularly in the Asian cases, often the children have gone to the previous place, seen the previous family. And, and then the intense, you might think the intensity of the memories would grow, but they, it actually tends to lessen. Uh, mm-hmm. I think partly because their memories are validated. You know, they, they don't have to keep struggling to convince people because there it is, they see it themselves. But they also see that life has gone on, moved on, and you know, families are grown older and, and have their own lives. Um, so in the same way with, with parents in general, just emphasizing that those memories are behind them and, and this time they're all going to be, families going to be safe together and, and you know, have, have a good life this time. Uh, we don't encourage people to ask a lot of pointed questions. I mean, it's awfully tempting to try to find out what the name is, but the, the concern about asking a lot of pointed questions, one, it may upset the child, but two, they may start just making up answers. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's better for the most part. It can kind of come spontaneously. But, you know, when the child, or, uh, child is in that zone of wanting to talk about these things, you know, certainly asking open-ended questions of what else you remember or, you know, that must have been hard or, or whatever, ha- letting the child talk. And again, you know, asking they remember what their name is or where they lived or whatever. I mean, that, that's very helpful for us if it's accurate information. 
Yeah. Again, going back to what I saw in the show um, with this case of Atlas. And when he was recounting, he was a young, uh, I think it was a young white kid. He was recounting this past life as a young black child who died on a playground. And I'm just curious, uh, are there any commonalities in terms of like people taking on new ethnicities or the same ones? I know you said they can cross genders. Um, I know that uh, most of these reincarnated people are, or cases are from, uh, their last life was less than two years before they, the, the death was two years before. What are some of the other uh, commonalities that you've seen? Well, as far as ethnicity goes, um, I mean, the kids in a lot of the places where we've studied cases, um, they're not a whole lot of necessarily different ethnicities. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the I am, you know, just sort of a melting pot, but in, in say, I mean, I don't know, Thailand or Burma or whatever, I get maybe the recruits, but I mean, for the most part, people, re the kids recall a life in the same country, often fairly close by. I mean, here in the States, we've had some that are, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of miles, but you know, usually it's fairly close. So the way I interpret that is that for intact memories to come through, typically it's, Things haven't gone too far. I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, it's usually the same country. It's often kind of um, um, same geographical location, near near geographical location. It's often a uh, fairly recent life. So it's it's not um, for entire memories to come through. It's not something where it's typically on the other side of the world. Um, so with the American cases. Um, I'm trying to think of others where they had, uh, you know, they had a different ethnicity or different race. And I can't say that others immediately come to mind, but I'm sure we've had them. Um, but again, with the American ones, I mean, unless we can identify the previous person, we, we don't know what race they were. Uh, but I mean, sometimes children, a white child will say, oh, that was when I had brown skin or, you know, something like that. But, um, the short answer is, you know, we don't know a lot about that. Um, yeah, I think it's fascinating. I mean, I, I, I've, I'm, uh, I've been studying sort of spiritual texts for many, many years. And, you know, there's this whole idea of, of obviously karma and just sort of the evolutionary aspect of living and experiencing all sides of humanity. And I know you're not a huge fan of, uh, of past life regression in terms of, you know, any kind of proof that, that, or, or any sense of verifying or validating it. But have you read any of uh, Dr. Michael Newton's work, Journey bit. of the Souls and yeah. all of that? Yeah. One thing I, I'm also, I, I consider myself to be a skeptic. And one thing I, I appreciated about what I could gather from reading, you know, just it's the one thing to do the research, another thing to read someone else's report of their research. But one thing I appreciated from his books particularly journey of the souls is he seems to present it in a relatively objective fashion. So, you know, it's all transcriptions. You can see the Q and a that he's having with his clients in his office. He's done thousands of cases and all of that. And he, he said that he doesn't, he tries not to lead the patients and say things like, okay, now do you see a white light? Are you floating? He just goes, tell me what's happening now. And now what are you experiencing? And he's seen a lot of overlap in people's reports. So yeah, just from, my own personal interest in these kinds of things is just interesting. The implications, all of the implications that I'm sure you've also um, pondered about and, and wondered about, you know, in terms of life after death, is it just these kids or is everybody experiencing this? And so I'm just curious, like behind the scenes, <laughs> when it's you and your colleagues talking about these cases, is there, is it purely scientific or is there a little bit of uh, like, like you have your own sort of biases and, and you're kind of, you know, operating within those and you're aware of those or, or, or what is your experience like behind the scenes? Well, I suppose we all have biases of one sort or another. I mean, sometimes, sure. you know, you hear something and think oh, that's just kind of too far out there for me, but um, 
but you know we're not coming at it from any particular um, spiritual outlook um, and, and you know, I identify now in the groups uh, spiritual but not religious and, and you know that we're in it trying to figure it out for ourselves you know trying to determine for ourselves well, what's what's going on here so I you know it's not one of trying to confirm a previous view it's, it's trying to see kind of where the, the evidence takes us and I mean again we all have particular um, slants on things, uh, but as much as possible, they, they really are not particularly part of this work. Um, some of the oddities that has, have been reported are kids going for cigarettes and alcohol that they used to consume in their previous life. Yeah. So you have these little six-year-old kids trying to, you know, and, and, you know, tapping the beer bottle in the same way that they used to tap it in their old life to get the last little drop of beer out. Are there, are there any things that you just seen that you just think are completely bizarre, bizarre like that? Well, you know, now that you say it, maybe I should view that as bizarre, but it's just, yeah, I mean, they, these kids have a variety of behaviors that seem to be linked to the past life. And, and it includes it, if the previous person was a heavy smoker or drinker, that the, the child will still want those things um and yeah i guess that is a little odd but you know or you can see in their play sometimes compulsively uh doing things that, that there's nothing in their environment that might lead them to as far as we can know occasionally grizzly play like um you know, a child acting like they're hanging themselves or whatever but um it's, it's usually more the occupation but but even then you know, like one particular case, this kid played up being a biscuit shopkeeper. I mean, for hours and hours on end. And um, I mean, the past life, that's what the guy did. But, but you know, why the, the, the child is so focused on that in, in some sort of, explain it in some sort of ordinary way, you know, becomes a real challenge. Um, so with the behaviors, I mean, it's not firm evidence as much as recalling a name and, and you know, where you're from. But it's still, it becomes part of the picture that, that at times can be quite persuasive. When you're not wearing your scientific hat, though, how would you interpret all of this? Let's say you had to give a sort of spiritual explanation. What would you say? Well, uh, I can't really give you a, kind of a pithy answer to that. I mean, I think well, what all this work has led me to do is look that's sort of uh, the bigger picture of what existence even is or what it um, means. And, you know, because you can't just map these cases on sort of a typical Western understanding of, of reality uh, that, you know, physical matter is all there is. I mean, that, that doesn't work in this case. So, you know, at the level of evidence, okay, well, how do you make sense of it? And um, I've, eventually come to believe that, and this sort of shares with certainly physicists as well as, as um, various spiritual traditions, but that, that consciousness really is the core of reality and, and um, this world that we experience or the basic building blocks of the world, I, I think are not you know, particles and waves or whatever, but really are observations and, and knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, become more of an idealist where it, the, the mind is, is really at the core of everything. So, you know, with that, then, then you look at these cases as kind of a series of observations or experiences that for whatever reason have continued from one, one life to another. It seems to be the same stream of consciousness or same stream of, of experiences. Um, now why that happens in these cases you know, not in, for all of us as, as far as we know. I mean, that we don't know. But um, anyway, that, that's kind of my take on all of this at this point. So there is this, I mean, we don't use the term spiritual because of course there are all sorts of connotations with that. But there is this piece of us, this mind piece or consciousness piece that seems to be at the core of who we are. And mm -hmm. at least in these cases, does not seem to be limited to just the lifespan of, the brain or the body, uh, but it seems to, to be um, more primary than that and, and has continued through multiple uh, lifespans. 
It, has there been an evidence-based explanation for deja vu outside of like being a child? Let's say as an adult, I mean, we've all experienced it. You go to a place, you feel like you've been there before. Have you seen anything or come across anything that Well, I mean, there are neurological, neurological explanations. I mean, it sort of depends on what you mean by deja vu. And yes, I mean, I, I think most of us, maybe all of us, have that experience where, I mean, we... It feels familiar to us and like we'll be in a conversation. We can't quite say what's coming next, but it feels like we've experienced it before. And there may well be a neurological explanation for that. Now, once where people go to a place they've never been and are able to identify things, you know, like some of these children have done. Uh, I mean, that's literally deja vu uh, as far as seeing before. Um, and, and of course, can't imagine a neurological explanation for that. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, with a lot of this, I mean, again, with medical explanations, they aren't, there's not necessarily proof, but that's sort of where the evidence or the logic takes people. So, uh, you know, neurologically, as far as whether somehow an impression sort of gets ahead of, of the conscious awareness or whatever and creates this sense that, that you've experienced it before uh, would explain the simple cases, but but not the, uh, the vivid ones. And after, after, coming across so much compelling evidence that there is potentially, at least some people experience uh, reincarnation. What else professionally are you wanting to see in this field? What would you like to see more of? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I would like to see greater awareness of sort of the abilities of mind to exist separate from the brain, either after death or things that it can do. So parapsychology, which, you know, a lot of people think there's nothing to it because they've been told there's nothing to it. And yet there's tons of evidence uh, about particular abilities with, you know, with telepathy or, or premonitions or various things. And, and um, uh, so it would, it would be good to, to see people become more aware of that work. Mm. What's your take on destiny? Do you have one? I don't have a firm take on it. You know, is all this planned out? Did we kind of, uh, and, you know, there are people who talk about you just kind of have a contract when you enter a life and, and you, know, you mm -hmm. fulfill it. Um, I don't have a strong feeling one way or another about that. Um, I think we may all have, um, sort of a path that kind of is the best fit for us. Um, but, you know, we may get off of that path or we may choose not to follow that path. So in, in that sense, we don't reach our destiny. But um, I, again, I, I only have a sort of general, uh, general thoughts on it. And your first book in this work was, was it Return to Life? Uh, the first one is called Life Before Life. And life the, before life. Yeah, follow up was return to life. So that's the life before life was the one uh, that you were sending out all the query, query query letters to see about getting an agent and a yeah. publisher. Can you just quickly share that story? Because <laughs> I think it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I, I to be perfectly honest, um, when I read Ian Stevenson's books, I thought I'm, I'm never going to be able to equal this. But, you know, could I write a different kind of book and write one to make the general public more aware of, of this work? Um, so I learned that you write up a book proposal and you, know, you send out query letters to agents. So I, I looked at books in sort of the same general field. Most people acknowledge their agents. So I, I sent out a variety of query letters. And um, one of them I sent uh, was to uh, an agent, Patricia Van Loon who, uh, Vanderloon, who um, got my letter uh, and I guess got my proposal. Now, now it's been so long ago, I'm blocking out the details, but as luck would have it, one of her other authors had just been telling her about the work at UVA and with, you know, with Ian Stevenson, she gets my proposal. And um, again, as luck would have it, she then had a, a lunch scheduled with a friend of hers who was an editor at St. Lawrence Press. She takes the proposal with her and um, the editor sold on the idea. So I essentially had a contract before I even knew about it. And um, 
you know, so she, I, I was happy to, to hear that. Um, so, you know, how do you, what do you make of that? Well, you can decide, I was just lucky that, you know, the pieces all fell together. But when things like that happen, you know, you do kind of wonder about destiny and, and how would that work? I mean, I, you know, the, um, I didn't cause her to have this other author who knew about our work and was telling him about it and uh, telling her about it. And, and you know, I didn't cause her friendship with the, the editor. Uh, but somehow all the pieces, all the pieces put together or fit all the pieces fit together uh, so that it's, it worked for me and, and, you know, sort of helped me on the path that I was trying to get to. Um, so people can make of that what they will. And, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything paranormal about that or, or even that unusual. I mean, I think we've all had situations where the pieces fit together in a way that, that take us in a path that, you know, we're very glad to be on. Um, and again, what do we make of that? Um, it, it, go ahead. Yeah, no, it reminds me of the Einstein. Um, I don't know if Einstein actually said this, but he is attributed as saying, as saying that you can either believe that nothing is a miracle or that everything is a miracle. And, um, you know, when you think about the implications of your work and, and whether there is life after death, and or whether we all come back and maybe some of us remember it and some of us don't remember it. Um, I just think it's really interesting to be on the front lines of that, that sort of research. And, you know, you know, there's this guy called, uh, his name is Dr. Herbert Benson, who was uh, one of the first researchers and scientists to really in-depthly study meditation back in the 19th late 1960s and 70s. And what was interesting about his work when I read a lot deeper into it was that he, even though med he saw that meditation was, was and particularly transcendental meditation was having all these really amazing changes in the parasympathetic nervous system, things that he had never seen before. And he was a, he was a, he was a researcher of stress and the, the fight flight reaction. And so he saw that meditation could take somebody into the exact opposite direction. And so it was literally the most powerful um, method for relaxing the body that he'd ever come across. But he refused to learn meditation or practice it because he wanted to maintain his objectivity, <laughs> which I thought was impressive. I thought that was pretty impressive because it must have been very enticing, you know, and I'm just, I'm imagining in your line of work, it is enticing to, you know, lean into the sort of confirmation bias of, yeah, we're all one. Everything is, you know, connected. There is destiny. I've seen enough. I'm sold, but yet you still maintain this sense of, of objectivity. Is that difficult for you to do? Uh, not really. I mean, my makeup is that, you know, I continue to kind of question everything. Yeah. You know, there are some people who are hundred percent sure of everything. And then there are those <laughs> of us who aren't really a hundred percent sure of much. And, um, you know, I fall into the latter category, which, you know, is, I think it uh, lends itself to the work to be sure. Now, I don't know that I'm as self-sacrificing as, as Herbert Benson in that case. I mean, if, you know, if you do all this work and discover sort of the relaxation response can, can profoundly change your life, and you decide you don't want to do it so you can keep studying it. I mean, good for him, but well, sort of good for him. Um, I, I admire the commitment to the work. Um, but that, you know, that's, that, that's something there. Um, but, you know, I think with, with our work, I mean, it's not that hard because I don't remember a past life and you know, I'm not trying to verify that I ever had a past life. Um, so then when we get these reports, I'm, I'm very curious. I, I have an open mind completely about what is the level of evidence that, that this case provides or a connection to the past life. And, and that's what we try to determine. And so uh, you've also said that you ideally would love to have more American cases. Why is that? Well, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there are these potential cultural confounds with, you know, if, if everyone around you believes in a past life, you know, it does make it more likely that people may either overinterpret what the child says or the child may 
start thinking they'd had a past life and, and sort of come up with memories. Whereas with our cases, I mean, most of the American families did not believe in reincarnation before their child started talking about a past life. And of course, our culture doesn't believe them. Um, so mm -hmm. that from a scientific standpoint, it, it's a cleaner phenomenon here than it would be in other places. Uh, in addition, I think it can be more persuasive that something out of the ordinary is going on. You know, you, you can't just dismiss it as something that happens on the other side of the world among you know, people who, who believe in reincarnation, but it, you know, it's happening down the street. Uh, so I, I think that may help open people's minds more uh, to this phenomenon. And yeah, yes, we do want to keep studying American cases. And, you know, if we've had 50 cases as strong as, as strong as, as our um, best two or three, uh, then it would be very hard for people, I think, not to seriously consider them. And again, if you're listening, if someone is listening to this and they think possibly, or maybe, I don't know if some people may even wish their child was special in this way. <laughs> is there any sort of preliminary screening that you said, you said there's a list on your website that they can go to as a sort of a way to kind of determine whether or not this is something that you guys could work with. Is that the first step well, that they would take? Let's go to um, but yeah, but again, I mean, it is often not a pleasant experience for the child or the family. So, I mean, I get that people would be curious, but, um, if a child does not remember a past life, they are probably better off not remembering it. So, you know, because so many of the memories that come through are upsetting and mm. feeling like you've lost your family uh, or that, that um, you have another home or what, you know, those things are difficult for children to process. So, um, I, I and I, I remember you, them. yeah, you also said in the Marty uh, episode that, that, uh, one of the things that he recall, recounted was that he wanted to live his life in a better way, in a different way. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be less, um, uh, well, well, I can't remember exactly. Well, what he less was. materialistic, really. Less but, materialistic, yeah, he, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, he felt like he was not greedy in this life and maybe he had been previously. Uh, so I suppose in that sense, I mean, it perhaps was helpful to him in his development that he could see, I want to be better than that this time. Um, but he also, you know, he suffered a lot. I mean, he, he had a, a lot of times that, where he was very upset about it. Right. Um, how, do, how I'm assuming you, you feel fulfilled now in this line of work. How, how, how does that feel different to what you were doing before in, in child psychiatry, just in you and your body and your, in your day to day? Cause I, I just want people to understand the differences, at least from your perspective? Well, I actually like the mix I have now where I'm, I'm doing work in the clinic where, you know, we are, we're helping people. And uh, since I'm not doing it eight to five every day, I, I, I can appreciate it more. And, and, mm -hmm. and I think I actually probably do a better job. I mean, I think I'm able to connect with the families more and, and uh, you know, help them through what they're going through. But then I also get a look at the kind of big picture and, and you know, these, ask these big questions and, and try to explore the answers. Uh, and I enjoy the writing part of it too. But um, so it's all together, it just works for me better than, um, than, than when I was just doing clinical care. Okay, so I want to just do a hypothetical with you as we wind down, <laughs> if you're, you'll play along with me. Imagine if you didn't go into the Quest bookstore, you never got invited to volunteer with Dr. Stevenson's work, and you were just kind of, your life just went on whatever path it ended up going on, aside from what you're doing now. And you can go back and knowing everything you know now from being fulfilled and living this life, you can go back to the old Dr. Tucker and give him any words of wisdom, any advice back in the early 90s. Is there anything you'd say about how to proceed? Uh, well, uh, I think, you know, there are times where we have a goal that we're working toward and we just focus on it like a laser beam and go toward it. There are other times where um, 
we just have to be open to what may come and, and you know, not exactly just sort of float on the, the, the current, but, but um, you don't have to have necessarily a clear direction to be going somewhere, but you do have to have a, a mindset of, of being open to what opportunities may come. And, you know, it's, it's challenging. I mean, we all, or, you know, a lot of people have sort of dreams of what they'd like to do, but we operate in, in the real practical world. And, mm-hmm. you know, a lot kind of had to fall into place where this worked out for me. Um, if it hadn't, I, mean, I, don't, you know, I don't know, I, I think I would have continued to work for something more uh, than what I had been and, you know, could have found it in other ways. And, and obviously, I mean, people find meaning in many ways. And, and I mean, the most meaning I find in my life is, is um, me through the, the love with my family. So, you know, being a good husband and father, now grandfather uh, is, is really where I derive the most meaning. And so sometimes it means um, discovering meaning that's kind of there all along and, and maybe we're not fully appreciating it. Um, other times it means making the changes in your life that, that you need to uh, so that things will work better for you. Well, looping back around to um, how we started, I, I, I've been asking that question ever since I started this podcast. What's your uh, favorite toy or activity as a child? And a part of that is because I suspected that it has something to do with what they end up doing as an adult. But now after coming across your work, it could also have something to do with what they did as an adult in the previous lifetime. Well, and I think that's, that's right. That's yeah. so interesting. Um, I mean, there was a psychologist who would focus on not necessarily child's favorite toy, but the uh, first memory, not that that first memory caused them to turn out the way they did. But the fact that that's the one that they remember is indicative of, of um, meaning now. I mean, as you look back, it's important what it says about a person as an adult. Um, so it's kind of similar with what toy you remember. Yeah, may, may well be kind of influenced by the kind of person you became. Yeah. And, and, and I, 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 I'm very honest with myself about the fact that I use um, very sort of generous confirmation bias in connecting the dots between what they do now or what they're passionate about now versus what they started off doing. Because I found that in everyone's life journey that I've talked to, and you can make the argument that I only talk to people who have this particular experience, um, but they've gone through some sort of moment of confusion or uncertainty, or they felt unfulfilled. And that's why it's called at the end of the tunnels, because once they get through that period, they finally, they find their calling or their passion or they, or they lean into it. And this light inside of them turns on it and everybody who is around them can see it and it's attractive and you inspire people to want to invite you to talk on podcasts and want to, you know, feature you and profile you and hear what you have to say about whatever it is that you're passionate about. And then hopefully someone seeing your example will be inspired to do the same thing. And so um, all that to say, I just want to acknowledge you for taking the leap to reach out to Dr. Stevenson and, um, and in a way taking the baton, you know, after he retired and, and going all into this work. I love that little anecdote you shared about how you wondered whether you wondered how people would dress to go to one of these little research meetings. <laughs> you, you wore the most casual shirt and tie that you had and you walked in and, and Dr. Stevenson was wearing a three-piece suit. <laughs> and so in, in seeing you in the, in the show, I saw you were, you were dressed very smartly. So I think you've kind of found a hybrid there. <laughs> you don't have a three-piece suit, but you, you definitely have a nice style. So I want to acknowledge you for that. And, uh, and just, yeah, just for, for, inspiring us with your work.